The Detroit riot was one of the largest in U.S. history. It left 43 people dead. Thousands of National Guardsmen had to be deployed to the streets that were already in flames. The riot was an unusual period of time, but the frustrations were felt across the country. The next year, there were six days of riots right here in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. The city was left, parts of the city were left in ruins. A dozen people died, more than 1,000 injured, millions upon millions of dollars in damage, and more than 6,000 people arrested. Going off script with us tonight, Bernie Dem uh, Demchak and historian, longtime D.C. resident, Stanley Cooper, another longtime D.C. resident, political activist, and Dr. Uh, Antoine Jones, associate professor of sociology at George Washington University. Gentlemen, my question to all three of you, take, take your time to answer this question. Are, are we ready for Detroit, um, the movie? Yes, yes. Um, the retelling of the period of time in the 1960s is something that we are more than ready for. We need to uh, educate younger people about the, about the circumstances that gave rise to those to the events that took place. Bernie? I think we're very ready for Detroit. In fact, I think that Detroit came in Baltimore and Ferguson. I think that the uh, conditions in streets and in some of our urban centers today are just as bad as they were in Detroit. I reject this term riot. It was not a riot. It was an African-American rebellion, an urban rebellion against injustice, against oppression, against police brutality. And we're seeing that again today. And that's why we have Black Lives Matter. Professor? We're definitely ready. We just came off from um, kind of thinking about the uh, L.A. riots that happened um, in 92, the 25th anniversary. And so we're ready for this kind of, of uh, discussion. Again, the stuff that these um, you know, movies and documentaries highlight as being problems that kind of help facilitate those kinds of um, civil unrest acts um, are things that are occurring today. Yeah, the uh, discussions that are already going on as a result of Black Lives Matter and then the pushback from police unions, uh, I really reject the notion that you have to side with one or the other. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I just reject the notion that there are no bad police officers out there. Give me a break. Uh, and Black Lives Matter, let's not paint a broad brush of every cop that's out there, okay? Exactly. The bad cops make it very difficult for the good cops. I think we, all, we can all agree on that, right? Yeah. What are the lessons that, that we're to learn from uh, this movie, Detroit? Wh wh which is raw, it takes place inside this motel, Algiers Motel, the singing group, the dramatics, everybody's gonna know the name. They, they were stuck in this hotel and it goes on and on. Don't wanna get the movie, but what are the lessons? I would, I would hope that one of the lessons that is learned is that the police have to report on themselves. The fact that we have police that feel as though it's not proper for them to report what is going on in, in their own ranks is something that continues to be a problem. It, it gives rise to the, the resistance in communities and the, and the, and the mistaken belief that, that uh, the police are not their friends. The other lesson that we need to learn from this is that the police need to learn this history too. And so the police need to be very careful as they approach people, the way they talk to them, the way their body language, whether or not they have their camera on or not. This is an important lesson for police. I'm beginning the process now at Ben's Chili Bowl of teaching police officers DC black history and culture. 400 years of black history, 400 years of oppression in America, police do not understand that. That's why they need to be gentle when they approach conflict decreased attention, not exacerbated. A lot of these communities that saw disturbances, riots, whatever you want to call them, they've changed. They've been gentrified. Uh, how, how does that impact this discussion? How does that change the discussion, if at all? Well, you know, gentrification occurs when, um, you know, certain individuals with demographic characteristics, usually white affluent individuals, move into a predominantly black space. Um, riots were happening in those predominantly black spaces that were then changed into majority white spaces. So if anything that we can learn from this idea of, of uh, Detroit is that, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit of, of kind of physical change to create social change. But in other time, times, we actually see the opposite. We actually see social change being a, a part of physical. But, but, but Bruce, you're raising a very, 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 you're very, raising a nuanced question here. In fact, gentrification can increase the tension in the communities because a lot of people are seeing that they are being left out. African Americans built this community over the last 150 years, and they built a strong middle class community. Now, all of a sudden, they feel as if they're being pushed out with gentrification. There's still these pockets of poverty. As long as there's pockets of poverty, as long as there's injustice, there's not going to be peace. 
I'm glad you brought yeah. that up. You're absolutely right. Because you drive down 14th Street, 8th Street, and you can see, you know, you see the prosperity, you see the new restaurants, you see the outdoor cafes, and, and you look just behind those and you see the vestiges, the people that bought and are able to stay. The renters, a lot of them have been pushed out. We're out of time, but we're going to continue this conversation. Seriously, right. we're going to bring you back. Thank you. Still ahead, uh, we can